Welcome everyone. It is nine o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. People will continue to join and that is just fine. Thank you for joining us today for this session of Innovative Approaches to School Success that will discuss socioeconomic approaches. I'm Christy Gagne, a manager for Telehealth Rocks. Um, Telehealth Rocks is a federally funded program that focuses on school-based behavioral health, and we do this by working on social determinants, supporting school-based services, and telemetry and trainings just like this one. We have just a few notes for you before we get started. This session is being recorded and we will send it to you afterwards. Your microphone has been muted, but please feel free to unmute or type in the chat to ask questions. And then lastly, um, it's very helpful if you can type either your first and last name uh, into the chat to say hello or um, on your Zoom screen so that we can track attendance. We just have a couple of uh, informational slides to go through. We have no disclosures. There are no relevant financial relationships to disclose. And everything presented today is evidence-based and currently accepted within the profession. After the session, um, slides and recordings will be sent to you as soon as they're processed. Please give us just a little bit of time. We'll probably get it to you later today or early tomorrow. We've just got to process that recording and it takes us a few minutes. Um, certificates of attendance will be calculated and sent to you after the series ends in April. Um, and again, it's very helpful if you either type your name in the chat or make sure your first and last name are showing on your Zoom screen so we can we can track y'all. Um, if you have any follow up questions, please reach out to Telehealth Rocks and we'll be happy to help answer anything that you need. I did put the email there in the chat. So now I will hand it off to Robert Stiles to introduce everybody and get us started here. Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Robert Stiles. I am the program director for Telehealth Rocks, and I'm so pleased to have you here today. Um, we're going to focus on socioeconomic approaches today, which is, you know, food, housing, clothing, healthcare, all the things that may stand in the way of a kid's ability to be successful in school and that families may need in your community. Um, our presenters will be Angie Brungart, who is the MHIT field liaison coordinator, um, to discuss the mental health intervention team program. Uh, we have KSDE that's funded by the state legislature. Excuse me, I can't talk sometimes. Uh, and then we'll also talk to uh, Kimmy Health Center of Southeast Kansas, uh, who has had school clinics and school services across Southeast Kansas going back to 2010. Uh, Colette Lee, who's director of patient engagement, Felicia Hall, who's director of school health nursing, uh, some really innovative stuff uh, that they do with school health nursing, especially in small school districts. Ashley Neely, who's director of school-based behavioral health and Allie Bishop, who is a school-based therapist will be uh, presenting with us today. So great conversation and we'll have time for questions as we go through all this. Uh, next slide, please. So just to provide a little background uh, about Telehealth Rocks and also about sort of the impetus and uh, the over sort of an overview of this series. First of all, it responds to your responses when we ask you twice a year, what's important. These are topics that came up in our December survey. So we wanted to make sure we offered sessions related to each of these areas. So Telehealth Rocks, which stands for Regional Outreach for Communities, Kids, and Schools, is a school and community-based partnership. And yeah, school and community-based partnership. Always want to talk about community uh, to meet the needs of kids and their families. So we're really fortunate that we have more than 30 partners across national, state, and the local level, including everyone who's presenting as part of this series today. So in each of these sessions, our partners are going to discuss innovative approaches that they used to achieve this vision. Uh, and it really, as we started putting this together, what I realized is everybody that we were inviting to the table and all of the needs that people uh, were discussing from the school perspective was really about community. How, how can we make use of resources from the community in the community to help kids be more successful in school? And these are all topics that you identified as important, going back to uh, when we, every time you attend an ECHO, we get your email and then we ask you a couple times a year what's important and tell you to rank sort of what you wanna know about or what we can help you with. So today we're really gonna talk about food, clothing, housing, healthcare needs, that socioeconomic uh, approaches that often stand in the way of kids being able to learn, right? If they're hungry, if they don't have a good bed, if they don't have access to the healthcare they need, then they're not able to learn. Uh, then we're gonna move on to, and we'll have a couple of sessions, one that will focus on youth are at risk of involvement with the justice system, uh, as well as youth and families at risk or involved with the child welfare system and also meeting the needs of kids that are involved with those systems, the educational mm -hmm. needs. And then our final session will be about avoiding and managing substance use and some really uh, innovative approaches uh, related to 
uh, evidence-based approaches related to substance use and especially substance use prevention. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we link schools and communities? If this session is really about how do we make use of resources in our community, um, Telehealth Rocks has been really successful. First of all, because it's a partnership and it's led by all of our partners, um, but really especially focused on school districts. So we really believe that we can create schools and communities where every child has the resources and skills they need to have the exact same opportunity for success in life. We believe that every child deserves exactly the same opportunity to be successful in school and in life. To do that, we work to transform our communities through comprehensive and integrative approaches. Uh, we don't believe in creating things when something already exists. Everything you're gonna hear about during these sessions are things that already exist, that we partnered with, that we promoted, that we support, and we, we work to help make them more accessible across the state of Kansas and around the country. Um, and we do develop new solutions. One of the things you'll hear about today is uh, school-based community health workers, which this is really the first time that community health workers have worked extensively in schools. Um, because we'll do whatever it takes and we'll work hard, especially in identifying those programs that work um, and helping to amplify them, but also help create and support new programs where needed. So what's important when it comes to community-based work and support from your community? Um, we believe that everybody in your community, it has to be comprehensive. Everybody needs to be involved. Everybody needs to engage because the success of children is everybody's business. Responsive, locally led and defined at the local entities, as well as people like you tell us what is important and what to work on. That it's expansive, it makes use of all existing models and create new models. And that we also have to globally meet the needs of kids in their communities. When you ask why a school should be involved with things like food, housing, clothing, uh, youth impacted by foster care and things like that, they need to be involved because um, they, that they, they can't be successful in school. We can't tell a school it's their job to educate that kid and then have all these unmet needs that get in the way of their ability to be successful. As a receptive, we can't say we have the solutions. We have to listen locally to what solutions work and it has to be inclusive. And we believe that every one of our partners has to have an equal voice in what we do. Please, next slide. So moving uh, kind of forward, uh, we're gonna talk about the KSD and the mental health intervention teams. And then we're gonna have, um, talk a little bit about school clinics and school nursing and school-based community health workers and school behavioral health. Uh, we'll have some moderated questions and, um, but we'd rather hear your questions. So as you go through this and as you hear things, if you have questions come up as soon as we get done with the two presentations, uh, we'll ask you for your questions. And I'd rather have your questions than the ones we've come up with. Uh, so next slide, please. So I'll start with Angie Brungard from the Kansas State Department of Education. So I'll hand off to you, Angie. Great. Thanks, Robert. Um, and thanks, Christy, for allowing me this opportunity to talk to everyone about our program. Um, Angie Brunger, Mental Health Field Liaison Coordinator for KSDE's MHIT program. Um, you'll see also on this slide, uh, contact information for myself and for my director, John Calvert. So if you do have any questions, you're always welcome to reach out and connect with us. Next slide, please. This slide shows an overview of our program. Uh, it focuses on four categories. Um, we like to talk about um, their goals and characteristics of our program. So the first one talks about our mission, increasing every student's academic potential. The second one talks about what we do, connecting service providers. The third one talks about how customized our services are, how we do, how we provide our services, and four, uh, the fourth category talks about the why, us prioritizing our students' mental health needs. So I wanna dig a little deeper into this slide. So I'll go through each one of these um, goals so that you understand the importance of the goals and characteristics of our program. So with that first one, academic increasing academic potential, KSDE's MHIT program is dedicated to improving each of its students' overall academic potential by breaking down barriers to mental health services to those who need it most. We serve students K through 12. In that second category, connecting to service providers, under KSDE's guidance, school districts employ school-based liaisons who identify students needing intense behavioral, 
and mental health services and links them to local providers. And the third category are customized services. We want you to know that each of our MHIT programs, our 90 school districts, is unique and they customize their programs to fit the needs of their individual students, their families, and their community. And fourth, but definitely not least, we prioritize our students' mental health. This program is innovative, it's preventative, and it makes a difference in the lives of our most precious resources, our children. Next slide, please. This is how it all started. Uh, year one, 2018-2019, our legislature approved a program. Uh, it was a pilot program. It involved nine school districts, five mental health providers, 45 school-based liaisons across the state, and served a total of 1,708 uh, students. So those were students that weren't receiving therapy or case management services until our program came along. Um, uh, but it does get uh, better than that. Next slide will show you that um, as each year progressed, our program continued to expand beyond its expectations. You'll see um, each year we increased our school districts. That's the bottom row there. So we went um, from nine in the beginning 66 last year, um, we went from serving the 1,700 students to serving 6,014 students last year. That's across the state um, providing therapy and case management services. Um, next slide. This year, um, MHID is in its sixth year in uh, proviso. We serve 90 school districts, 24 of which are brand new to the program. Uh, our school districts employ 182 school-based liaisons. And in our December progress report, December 23, we served over 5,732 students. And that does include 477 foster care students. Next slide, please. This is a slide that shows our monitoring um, and how we monitor our program's progress. We do that through four indicators. Those indicators include the realms of academics, attendance, internalizing behaviors, and externalizing behaviors. We do this through an internet-based closed system. It's called our MHIT data portal. In addition, we'd like you to know that our program does have guardrails. Um, our agency does um, partner with mental health providers across the state, local mental health providers, um, and we do contracts, MOUs between them um, and our school districts, as well as um, we provide releases of information between our school districts and the guardians. This program is voluntary and um, we are having to engage with uh, families who are interested in our services. Next slide, please. This slide shows, um, is a picture uh, by USD Boundaries. It's our 90 school districts. Um, what I like to say about this slide is that um, it, it shows, um, uh, that there are clusters of communities that understand the value of this program. And that's what we feel is important is that this program continues to grow through word of mouth. Um, if one school district has it and another one hears about it, they want it. Um, and that's exactly what we, we like to see. Next slide, please. This is a list of our 24 newest school districts. What I like to show here is just the variance of our school districts. Um, uh, there are four that I wanted to point out here that are some of our smallest school districts in the program. They serve between 200 and uh, 300 students in their populations. So examples would be Burlington, Ness City, Golden Plains, and Rural Vista as some of our new districts. But we also have larger school districts. 
So you'll see Gardner Edgerton, uh, their student body serves around 6,000 students. And then also Dodge City serves around 7,000 students. Next slide, please. This is a list of our key players for the program. So like I mentioned, um, our school districts employ a school-based liaison and we like to call them the bridges. They share ec uh, educationally appropriate information amongst mental health providers and classroom teachers. Our next um, program player is our mental health provider therapists. They conduct assessments establishing treatment plans and continually assessing appropriate levels of care. What we like to mention about our therapists is uh, we're very thankful they come into our school buildings. That's the partnership that we've built. Um, and we find that that breaks down a lot of barriers for our families. Um, uh, the barrier of a parent needing to take time off of school to transport that student and also um, it breaks down barriers. It helps uh, destigmatize mental illness um, uh, between our um, families, our students, and school staff even. And then last but not least, um, another key player in this program is our mental health provider case managers. Uh, they work with therapists to implement treatment plan uh, goals in school and in family settings. Next slide, please. This slide shows um, the variance in our school districts. Um, our program, as you see down at the bottom, includes 90 school districts. Um, to break that down though and look at it, um, on this slide kind of helps explain uh, how different each program is. So we do have two school districts, their student body headcount is around 25,000 students. They employ 30 uh, school liaisons. Then we have medium school districts and they their student body is usually around 3,000 to 10,000 students. That's about 11 of our programs and they employ usually less than 10 school liaisons per school district. And then the majority are our small uh, school districts. And I I do apologize, um, that number 59 uh, should be in the 70s, I believe. That was a typo on my part. But those small school districts usually employ a part-time school-based liaison or up to school, uh, two uh, school-based liaisons per district. Um, next slide. So as we were talking about the size of our school districts, I just wanted to note how different our school liaisons roles and tasks look. And so the first um, box at the top talks about those lower population schools, the, the um, 70 some school districts that are smaller, those school liaisons usually um, uh, provide services to one to two attendance centers in their school district. Um, they do an excellent job of maximizing community resources and community relationships. And then those larger school districts base their programs on referrals and preventative programs. And what's unique about them, they may be spread thin, five or more attendance centers, but they typically employ master's level social workers who can also provide group therapy as needed for preventative care services. So when you look at our stats, you may see how many students we're serving in therapy, but what you're not seeing is how many students we are preventing from going into intensive therapy. And I also like to note that um, both of our programs, they assist with mental health student services, including referrals and connections with case management, school, and families. Next slide, please. And this is where we come full circle. Um, when we were talking about that fourth category, why this matters, um, this is from a high school student. And they say, my therapist saved my life. <laughs> I usually get choked up about this. Um, we can talk about our numbers all day, but this one student's sentiment says it all. MHIT's innovative, preventative, and it saves lives. 
And I think that's what we're here for. So, and that's, that's all the information that I have about our program. I'm sure you guys have questions. So we'll talk thank about that so after much. our next presenter. Yeah, Thanks. thank you so much, Angie. I, I, I'm so impressed with MHED and its growth. And I'm so pleased that our legislature is so strongly supportive of this program because it is a great and important program. So moving forward, um, I wanted to pass off to Community Health Center of Southeast Kansas, and we have a little bit of a team from there, so I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, but wanted to point out before we start that Becca Gerbrand in the uh, chat just said it's an amazing program to be part of, so big support from the audience. So please, I'll pass off uh, to Felicia or whoever at Community Health Center wants to get us started. Actually, I'm gonna go first. Um, my hey, name Colette. is Hello, um, my name is Colette and I'm the Director of Patient Engagement. Um, with Community Health Center of Southeast Kansas, there's so many parts, so many moving pieces that are constantly going. And we just wanna sit down today and just have a quick conversation of what that looks like and how we can help um, you know, continue to build our relationships and our partnerships with, with folks just around um, all of Kansas. Um, next slide, please. So the first question is, how did we get here? Um, South, Community Health Center of Southeast Kansas really was born out of the love of our students, um, our children. Um, we were not getting giving the vaccines that were needed um, locally. And our CEO, Krista Postai, realized this. And she was like, "How? what can I do um, to make sure that our children are ready for school? Um, so born in 2003 out of the partnerships between local school districts, hospitals, and universities, um, we came together and um, really worked hard on how can we outreach to those child care centers? How can we go to them? If they're not able to come to us, how can we go to them? Um, and how can we make ourselves more accessible? Um, so that is where we started. And then we have continued to develop services um, such as nursing um, that started in 2011. Um, behavioral health services in schools started in 2015, and community health workers started in 2022. Um, all three um, really work hand in hand together, um, which is very unique in itself. Um, I feel that that is one of the ways that we have been able to reach students and really get them ready is because it takes everybody, not just community health, but all of us as a community to make sure that students are ready for school. Next slide, please. So my focus today is just talking about our community health workers in schools. Um, and then Felicia will speak about nursing and Ms. Ashley um, and Ali will speak about behavioral health. But why community health workers? So this is near and dear to me. Um, I know that I'm on a time limit and I could talk about community health workers all day and all the specialties that um, our teams have brought um, that have just made such an impact. Um, a community health worker is just like what you see that puzzle piece. It's like bringing a, a community health worker to me is like the translator. They're the ones that help between the student, the caregiver, and the, the faculty members of how and what ways can we bring resources to make sure that they're ready for school. Um, it can be any, anything from food. Um, we all also know that there's a lot of bed bug issues. There's a lot of other pest control issues that um, we don't think about that are at, at the home. So if a child is not sleeping at night, they're not going to be ready to go when it comes the next morning. Um, so it's everything and anything. Um, I always like to say it's not your job, it, make it ours, um, because we want the, the teachers to really focus on what they need to be doing in regards to teaching the student. All those other pe pieces of clothing, you know, needing clothing, like I said, pest control, all of those pieces is where our community health workers get to stand up and really help find and navigate through the resources. They get to fill that gap that nobody else can really fill because they are so busy with resources. Um, I have to say um, the main thing about a community health worker in schools right now, we have um, five community health workers, which I'm super proud of, um, and that's in four districts. Um, we have not only been able to help students, but also, like I said, their caregiver and the faculty. Um, there has been many a time that faculty have come to us and said, hey, I'm having issues myself. I need resources myself. So how can we go ahead and help that faculty member be able to meet their needs so that they can teach better or they can do their job better, which is a reflection again on our children. Um, I do want to mention too with the community health workers, 
we believe that there's enough students to go, go around. Um, there's so many resources in schools. I, I can't say enough how there are times, and I'm just going to be very, very honest. There are times that they're like, no, these are our kids. We're good. Um, let's not talk about that community health worker role and where you're coming from. But but in truth, it's about all of us as a community. Um, we work with Spark Wheel. We work with the Early Childhood Block Grant. Anybody that is in a specific school, we work with. And on top of that, a community health worker not only needs to understand about the students and the um, caregiver as well as the faculty, we have to understand the district. So we, when we first start into a district, it's about how do we develop that relationship that they know that we're in it with all of them, not just here for one purpose and one pur purpose. It's about all the purposes that need to bring a student to school. Um, I did, I, I was going to say, if you guys have any questions, because like I said, I could talk about this all day long. I get pretty excited about it. Um, and, uh, you know, just the fact that we have this opportunity to have these things. Thank you, Robert, for, for, and, and Miss Christy for having this. Um, if you have any questions, just please keep those for the end, but definitely write them down. Um, and then I will put my email information in the chat if you have any questions that need to be directed towards me. So I'm going to hand this off to Ms. Felicia Hall. She is the Director of Nursing um, for School Health, and she'll talk to you about her programs. Hey, everyone. Like Colette said, my name is Felicia. I'm the Director of School Health Nursing. I've been with CHC for over three years now. I've been working in strictly school health. Next slide, please. So CHC's mission is to enhance students' academic performance and healthy lifestyle choices by providing medical, dental, behavioral health, and supportive services. So there's so many things that we provide in our schools. Um, like Ashley, she's going to talk about behavioral health, but we have our outreach team. We have immunizations team. So we have a lot of different resources that we have in our school districts within CHC. Next slide, please. So the school-based health centers, um, we have a group, and that'll be on the next slide, of our school-based health clinics that we have. So we have the service coordination and medical services that we can provide in our school-based health clinics are acute illness, um, injury care, we can do well-child visits, we can do sports physicals, immunizations, chronic care management, and COVID-19 testing along with flu, strep, and all those other things that you can do in school-based clinics. We can pretty much do everything. Um, that regular clinics can do except for x-rays. That's one thing that we do not have. So they are sent to our main clinics um, within CHC if they're needing any kind of x-rays. And um, we do do telehealth services. That'll be on the next slide of all the schools that we have. And we just started that program this last school year and it's really blossomed. So we have quite a few in our staff and our students and everybody really love our telehealth services that we provide. We do mental health services. We do oral health. We do health education and youth development. And then I won't talk a lot about the school-based rehabilitation health because Ashley Neely will touch base on that. Um, and then our school health services. So we, again, we have school nursing, we have dental outreach, medical outreach, state required screenings, immunization, flu shot clinics, health education training, policy procedure and records. Next slide, please. Um, our school-based health centers. So we have school health, six school health centers that we have school-based clinics in. We have 13 schools that we have school staff or CHC staff contracted in. So that is our school nurses and our school health assistants. We set foot in 49 different buildings and that's staff that we have in all of our buildings. So again, school health assistant nursing. So our school, our six school based clinics that we have are USD 250, um, 445 and Coffeeville. Our Wyandotte, we strictly do just telehealth for Wyandotte. We do not have a provider that steps foot in there. We do strictly telehealth. USD 257, Iola, and Baxter Springs, and Columbus. We have seven school districts that we do our telehealth program in, and they are all listed here. I will not have to read them all off to you. But like I said, strictly Wyandotte is who we do telehealth through. And our telehealth services is with our nurse practitioners. Um, that are in our school-based clinics. So our providers that we have in there, we have four or five different ones um, that we have in there. And so they're a great resource for our clinics. And then we also do nursing from afar and supervision. So for Chautauqua and St. Paul, 
some of those smaller school districts that can't afford school nurses, they contract with CHC. And so my staff and I, I have two school coordinators that work with me. So we go there, travel there, we do their immunizations and whatever else that they need for school nursing. And then St. Mary's Colgan is a new district that we're doing this year. And then we do nursing supervision for Oswego. So we work with a the nurse there. And if there's any resources or anything she needs, we help her out. Next slide, please. So these are just areas of where the school um, based health services are within CHC. I will not read all over those with you, but with our outreach team, I know we set, we have 57 different school districts that our outreach teams go to. And again, that we can do and then sports physicals, we do it, kindergarten enrollment. There's so many different services, immunizations and all those fun things and hearing vision, drug testing, nicotine testing. So there's a lot of different that we do in there. Next slide, please. And who is this all for? This is all for our students, our families, the districts. So far to date, I was actually pulling up our numbers while we were doing this meeting. And so far we nursing wise have seen 110,000 students and the month's not even over yet. And that's just for nursing. So that's not for behavioral health. That's not for our community health, worker, health workers, our outreach teams, that's strictly just for nursing. Um, so we see so many different students and provide so much care for those students and work closely with our community health workers, our behavioral health team and all those. So really that's what we're here for is our mission is to take care of our students. And that is it, that's all I have. On the next slide, I don't know if they have that in there or not, I can put it in the chat, is my contact information. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to email me, call me, that's my personal cell phone. We travel a lot, so feel free to call if you have any questions. I'm Ashley Neely, I'm the Director of School-Based Behavioral Services with Community Health Center. I was actually our first school-based therapist way back in 2015. Um, I was working in clinic as a behavioral health consultant and therapist working on the medical side of things, helping to get folks connected with the services that they need, or even just providing real-time um, intervention or emergency services. And Krista Postike came to me and said, Ash, uh, we need you to go to school. Uh, they need some help at school and we need you to go. So in February, which is a weird time of the school year for all of you that know, um, I went February 5th of 2015, was handed a list of 10 kids. And by the end of the short month, I had 30. And by the end of the year, I had 80. Um, and it just continued to grow from there. A couple of years later, we were able to um, acquire some therapists in Labette County uh, so I got three more, and then my helper came the next year in Pittsburgh in the form of Allie Bishop, who is was going to join us today, but she is actually, uh, she is one of our school-based therapists. She is actually at school today, and one of our little friends needed her support more than we needed her here, um, so she is tending to that. I um, actually was able to join you, Ashley. Oh, there you are, yay. <laughs> and so... Um, and then and now that brings us to date to where I currently have 14, maybe 15 today, school-based therapists, not including myself. We currently serve nine districts and I have like seven, six more waiting in the wings as we try to find therapists. Um, so uh, kind of what Angie was talking about earlier, just trying to connect those kids and meet them that may didn't have access to mental health services and be able to get them back in the classroom instead of missing um, a whole lot of time and stress for parents trying to find a way to get them to appointments that we can meet them where they're at. And we have the beautiful opportunity to having our offices in the schools. So, and as, so as part of that, we do, uh, a few of our schools are engaged in the MHIT program. And so we are some of those providers that helps on that end of things, which is exciting and continuing to grow. Um, before I let Allie just kind of give you an idea of what a typical day is like for our school-based therapist, I did see a question, I think, about how we connect together in the community, like with the mental health centers and MHIT and everyone. 
it takes all of us. There are plenty of kiddos with needs to go around. And we've been very fortunate to be able to work where if we have a therapist in the school, we can provide therapy and then connect with our um, mental health partners to look at case management or peer support or whatever other uh, needs that the family may have. Um, and that goes with Colette and our community health workers too. They have been a fantastic resource for us as they can um, meet the needs of, or try to meet the needs of the entire family. So in the beginning, when it was just the few of us, we were trying to manage all of the things. And with the addition and the growth of all of these services and everything our community has to provide, we now have the opportunity to be able to reach out and hand them those and know that they'll be taken care of and we can get back to doing therapy, which is amazing. Um, one of the cool things about CHC2, um, and I'm kind of proud of, is like even our, our food program um, kind of came from our school-based therapists in expressing the need before spring break about how we worry about our kids and our families um, not having the food that they need for a week or the resources they need. And so we started putting things in action to try to help with that. And um, I'm, I'm extremely proud of the work that we do um, and happy to get kids back in the classroom, happy to um, help with truancy and behavior and all of the things that our kids face. Um, and I'll let Allie tell you just a little bit about what a typical day is like for a school-based therapist. I'm Allie Bishop. Thank you for listening to us talk about our wonderful programs. Um, it depends on the school that I'm in. I, I'm in two different schools. As Ashley said, we've grown, um, you know, through the years that I've been here. This is my seventh school year. Um, and I have I feel like I've learned to navigate the school system pretty well and fit in where I am needed. Um, I start my day in the drop-off line, greeting students, helping kids get into the building. Um, it's not therapeutic, but it is absolutely relationship building. So that's where I start my day pretty much every day. Um, unless I have a kiddo in crisis like today. Um, and so I just navigate those waters, whatever the kiddo needs and to try to find a way to be successful in school today is what I do with them. Um, and that's not just with kids that are on my caseload, so to speak. I try to be supportive of mental health needs in the building that I'm in. Um, counselors out today, so that was, it's a good thing that I'm here today. Um, then I typically return to my office and um, start my schedule for the day. On any given day, I see anywhere from um, eight to 13 kids, depending on whether or not I'm running groups. So um, in our schools, in the elementary schools, we are only able to pull kids during their specials times. So every day is a different day. Um, they're not always going to the same specials. Every Tuesday is not the same. So I do my schedule daily and, um, you know, rotate through those kids. Just a, an example, in this school, I have close to, uh, I think it's 56 kids right now on my caseload just in this one elementary school, and I'm here three days a week. So, um <laughs> school bell. Um, I just have to navigate that schedule and get these kids in here. And, and the thing about having an office in the school is one, it's pretty amazing um, because the kids are here and I don't have to rely on somebody else bringing them to me. I can go get them so they don't miss therapy. Um, but also I can get them in and out and back to class and they're not missing any time out of their classroom schedule. And that's really important for a lot of our kids who struggle with truancy. Um, I think another benefit to this of being in the schools is that I do get to work with all the different programs. Um, County Mental Health has different programs that come in and out of the school. And I work with a lot of those kids and we share a lot of families. Um, so I can link them with different services like 
through our community support workers or through our school nursing and our clinics. Um, that's another really unique relationship too, is to be able to work with our school nurses. I like, I've already checked in with Kami today for my little friend that had a rough day. She's a school nurse here, um, just to make sure we have some services on board for her throughout the day. So um, it's pretty fast and, and it'll be three o'clock before I blink. Thank you so much. And before I jump into questions, I'm going to make sure I haven't missed anything else. I apologize for jumping ahead of everyone. Well, I know we've gotten so many questions and comments. And so before we kind of move to sort of the structured questions, I wanted to ask if uh, anybody uh, wanted to speak up and ask any questions that they might have. This is you're the audience and supporting and hearing about and learning about and getting um, your questions answered is what matters to us because you know, we, we really believe in this work and we believe in some of these approaches. As we wait for questions, let's go to um, the next slide and that may help people think about questions that they have. So often when you think about community-based programs and community support um, for kids, a question that comes up is how does your program or your organization build a relationship with districts? Um, Angie, I don't know if you want to start about, you know, you talked about and the growth that you've seen since 2019. Do how do school districts approach you or how do you think of how do they think about it? Or even why would they be interested in, in HIT in their school district? Yeah, yeah. Happy to. Um, one of the things uh, that I, I did mention, our program is in continues to be um, a yearly program approved by the legislature. So after we get the go-ahead for our program. Uh, every year we open up our application process. Um, all of our uh, uh, school districts that are already on board are included in that application process. After we take care of them with the funds that we are provided by the legislature, then we open it up to uh, other school districts. And we are so thankful that every time um, we've gone through this process, we are always able to provide services to any school district that asks for it, um, which is pretty darn unique. But we involve um, superintendents in that process in the beginning. Um, we appreciate that relationship that they're hearing about the program and want to partner with us and this program. Um, but we also uh, feel that it's essential that we include the entire school system um, in supporting uh, this program and its awareness. So I hope that answers. And similarly, um, you know, a question came up from Meredith in the chat. So we're gonna move to a second, a different one for, because we've got so many school-based therapists, school-based CHWs on the call. So I'm really interested um, how as a school-based therapist, you're able to collaborate with, you know, sort of the broad school staff. Uh, you guys mentioned school nursing, but school counselors and others. Kind of how does the community health worker or the school therapist uh, kind of fit into the team at the school? Um, and I would have to say that um, one of the keys that we make sure um, uh, and uh, uh, assist in coordinating and communicating with uh, our school as we come into their uh, schools is we're not interested in supplanting any service. Um, what our program does is supplement. Um, we're in addition to, so uh, we do realize we are a guest coming into a system that already has a lot of groups and connections. And so we just um, uh, step into that role saying, how can we help? Where do we you know, need to fill in the gaps? So Ashley, I know you uh, and have worked as a school therapist, kind of how do you communicate across that and how do you define, you know, often the question comes out, well, and I've had school districts that referrals to the school therapist go through the counselor so they can make sure all the other resources are being done, but what are ways that you coordinate across all the different roles in the district? Well, yeah, kind of going off what Angie said, yeah, we're an entity within an entity and you know, we're there to provide support and and also maintain boundaries, but our relationships with our school counselors, staff, teachers is very important. Um, so we want to let ourselves um, 
so they know our names and our recognition. Okay. Our referrals, I saw somebody ask, a lot of them do go through our school counselors because they're often the first contact um, at school that, with families that a kiddo may be having a hard time or it's brought to their attention and they can say, hey, our community has these resources and then that's how we can be introduced you know, it, with us being on site too. Sometimes when they're having those meetings, they can come see if, if we happen to be available and just introduce us to, to families and we can tell a little bit of what they do and give families, you know, informed information to decide what's in the best interest for their child and what works for their family. Um, uh, we are, one of our districts did a great job. I worked with their school counselor and we kind of created uh, this uh, PowerPoint for a professional development day that shows everybody's roles from principal administration, counselor, teacher, school-based therapist, school psychologist, what all the roles were, how we can interact together um, and kind of like who's on first. You know, we gave them different vignettes and um, like for teachers and who might, if you're presented with this, who are your supports for this area? And I think that really empowered our teachers to know that, hey, they have they have some backup, they have some staff behind them that they can help um, meet the needs of our kiddos. I'm going to um, ask Colette to talk about that, but also this idea of how do you build relationships with students and families. We've seen some great, um, Fort Scott's been active in the chat talking about the MHIT program and the Chase program, which is a program we'll hear about uh, later on uh, in a future week related to juvenile justice, kids involved with juvenile justice are at risk. Um, so we have the Chase program, we have a school therapist, we have the MHIT program, we have, and then we also have a school-based CHW. So how do you build relationships with students and families and um, reach out to them or even, you know, I know discussing that your child may need therapy is, a, is an issue, but also just even talking about basic needs like a bed or uh, other issues. So Colette, if you want to start us out, but I'd want to hear from everybody about sort of working with students and families and how you engage with them. Um, I think the main thing is to develop trust. Just across every single piece is about developing trust. We all know that teachers, and God love them, they are beautiful, beautiful creatures of all sorts, um, is that when it comes to their students, they they even hold them, you know, very, very tight, and they, they don't want to release them um, to anybody else and and to have other people engage with them until they know that you that you are there for the good of the family and for the student. Um, I think that's the main thing about any CHW in schools is to develop the trust all the way down, you know, from the top to superintendent, all the way down to the housekeeper, the janitor. Um, I do think that, you know, just like what was said earlier about, you know, when a family does um, get introduced from a counselor where they're saying, here's the community health worker that can assist you with resources. Um, I think that is a big piece um, of building those relationships. Being present, that is a big piece too of a community health worker is being present. Don't be sitting in your offices, you know, when you're, when you're not that busy. Be around, make friends, you know, you can never have too many friends when it comes to schools and also students need to see you if they don't see you and you're somebody new they're not going to know who you are versus seeing you in the hallways giving you high fives doing those pieces or even spending some time um, in the lunchroom that's something that I encourage all of our CHWs to do um, that way it's a most of the time it's a happy time that the children are eating and that just relates to them as I know that person I see her you know during lunch every day or him at lunch every day um, so I feel like all of those pieces we are able to build those trust factors similarly with you know mental health services which can be so um, you know sensitive how how do you, what's important? Is there anything to add on to what Colette talked about with the CHWs? I guess not. <laughs> Good. Well, I, I think um, it's important. Whoever is, I used to say, whoever is, knows that family the most, you know, has the best relationship is the best one, whether it's talking about school therapy or a child's needs uh, that may be unmet. 
um, it's important. You know, one of the things about CHWs is the idea is that they're part of the community, that they're a trusted person in the community, but also they're at the level of the person in the community that they're serving, right? That it's never about um, disrespecting or making people feel like, we. I believe that there are very few parents that don't want the absolute best for their child, right? And we start from that, that we're here to be your partner in doing what's absolutely best and what you want for your child. Um, and if you start from that, and if you start from a place where you're just, there's no judgment involved, I think sometimes you can really have the most success. And, you know, it's never about shaming, it's always about supporting, so. Robert, I did want to add- uh, Yeah, one please more go ahead, Angie. About um, uh, family engagement, and that is, um, you know, building those relationships. Um, we do, um, uh, we don't want to overlook our families, that they are included in the therapeutic process. We have um, our community mental health centers, and, and there are goals that we have in that therapeutic process. A lot of times, if a student is in therapy, then uh, once every third meeting, we're including the family. We're doing that usually through televideo, um, sometimes in person, but we're including that family engagement piece to this. Um, uh, we also, uh, there are therapists that uh, pull in the family at the end of the meeting, and they're usually doing that by televideo, but they're talking about um, their student and how things are going and how families can reinforce those behaviors at home too. So I just wanted to add that. <laughs> and I think it's important to never, parents are in charge, parents should be informed, parents should know. When I've seen issues, it can be because a parent feels like something happened to their child that they didn't know about or they didn't get permission for. And, you know, we have to respect and believe in and support parents and help them not stand in their way or, or you know, we're, they're, they're there to be our partner. And they want, I can't say enough, parents want what's best for their kids. They often don't have the resources, they may not know how to achieve it, but we're there to help with that. We're not there to stand in their way or get in their way. So I, I do want to jump um, so we can have a couple minutes for other questions from the audience. Um, if somebody was interested in impacting behavioral health or social determinants needs, you know, food, housing, clothing, they wanted to start something similar to what you guys have all discussed today, uh, what, would you, what would you recommend? Uh, what piece of advice would you give them? And I'm going to start with Angie, and then we're going to move to Community Health Center. I'd like to hear this from everybody. Um, where to start uh, with us, uh, we're a state agency and we do require legislative approval for our program. Um, so obviously uh, you're welcome to reach out to us um, to talk about programs. Um, we do open up our application process around April or May usually. So, so Colette and Ashley, uh, so first of all, if they were in Southeast Kansas, what would you tell them? And if they were not in Southeast Kansas, how would you tell them to think about or who to partner with or who to reach out to in their community um, for the type of things that community health centers doing in Southeast Kansas? Ashley, do you want to go first or you want me to go first? <laughs> I'll go. Um, if they're in Southeast Kansas, then definitely reach out to their schools, reach out to community health center, um, ask their pediatrician questions when they go to the doctor, any community member to create a bigger conversation or if they don't know you know continued reach if they're not in southeast kansas those would be the same resources um i would recommend their local um health center um schools counselors uh your doctors in your communities because it is for the community our kids are part of our community and important to us so I think it's a bigger conversation that we all need to have. Um, if it was my child and um, resources were scarce, then those are the folks I would start with is probably my school and my doctor and asking what can we do to, to get more support for our kiddos. I completely agree with Ashley. Um, imagine that I know you guys are like, really? Um, but I, I completely agree with her. 
because it is about each community. Every community is different. So every time that we do um, put a new nurse or a new CHW or new behavioral health um, in a district, we have to understand that district. So if a family or somebody is wanting to seek that, those, that piece of information, that's why you need to really go to that particular county, that particular school. That because everybody is so different and we respect every difference um, in every school um, and every community. And I think that's what keeps it going. That's what keeps the conversation going. Um, you know, what we do for USD 250 is totally different than what we do for USD 234. Um, so I completely agree. It's just about reaching out. Um, if you're here, if you're in Southeast Kansas, like Ashley said, please um, utilize any of the email addresses that you've received from us, or please go to Robert and Christy and they can give you um, our information. Always looking to help. Um, that's one thing, again, that I am so proud of Community Health Center. It's about us helping everybody. It's not just about us, it's about everybody. We have just a couple minutes. Um, I wanted to make sure from the audience that there was nothing important that you wanted to know from this group um, that we've missed. Well, I really want to thank everyone, and I, I really hope um, to see you in our, our next session. I'll let I'll hand off to Christy because I can't remember if we're talking about youth impacted by justice or um, the child welfare system next. Absolutely, I can wrap us up. So thank you, Angie and uh, Colette and Felicia and Ashley and Allie for joining us today and uh, talking all about your organizations. We learned so much about your uh, innovative approaches that you shared. Thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, we will send the slides as, and follow-up materials to your email. We also will post them online um, and our, on our Facebook page. And I just put those links in the chat. Again, give us a little time to process them, and we'll get them out to you as soon as we can. Um, we hope to see you at the next session. It is February 27th at 9 a.m., and we'll have families together and re the Restorative Justice Authority here, and they will share their approaches for youth at risk for juvenile justice. And that's Crawford, Crawford County Restorative Justice Authority. <laughs> so, sorry. And um, yep, thanks everybody. And we hope to see you next month. Have a great day.